Hello everyone, I'm Leah Kyo. I'm this year's Welfare and Equality Officer at TCDSU and as you can see today I'm joined by the wonderful Blind Boy. Blind Boy, thank you for having us. Thank you for having me. What's the crack? Oh, none much. We're delighted to have you here. So you're an artist, a writer, a performer, an advocate. Is there anything you won't throw your hands to? No, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll have a go at literally anything. That's uh, that's part, part of what I like doing though is it's it's embracing failure as part of my process, right? The one thing I find with, with anything I do, whether it's making music or writing books or making TV, the worst that can happen is I make a bollocks of it. And there's nothing wrong with that. So I just believe in trying everything. Because do you know what I wouldn't like? I'd hate to have not done something because I was scared of failing. Do you get me? So yeah. I have a go at anything. And it either works or it doesn't. Deadly, yeah. What's the worst that can happen? So I suppose, first of all, I want to thank you for joining us um, as part of this year's TCDSU's Mental Health Week. So we're delighted to have you, especially at this critical time. Um, mm -hmm. So even if you're showing me up with yourself, <laughs> we're delighted to have you part of this. So thank you. So now there's loads I want to talk to you about today. Um, but first, I have to ask, what's the story with the plastic bag? The plastic bag. Well, this now, this. So I, I've made a slight change recently. Normally, I wear a, a, a just a straight up plastic bag that comes from a Swords, a JC's shopping center in Swords, which doesn't exist anymore. They give me all of their uh, ten thousand plastic bags. But because I've been doing more Zoom meetings and I've been doing live streaming, the bag is really, really loud. You know. So what I did is I had one made, and this is a bag that's made out of satin. So it doesn't make any unnecessary rustling noises on the microphone when I wear it. So this is my special Zoom bag. And the reason I wear it really is I love being an artist. I like making art on the internet. I like writing books, but I don't like the idea of being well known, especially somewhere like Ireland, like I live in, in Limerick, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I want to be able to do my podcast, do all the stuff I do, but then I like going to Aldi later and not having people know who I am or not having people wondering what type of toilet paper I'm buying. You know what I mean? So I just don't like the concept of, of celebrity. I think it's and do you know what? My own mental health, too. Like, so for me, I, I've got a history of agoraphobia, social anxiety, things like that. So being out in public is, isn't necessarily my comfort zone, you know? Yeah. So what this bag kind of allows me to do is it allows me to just be a normal person, to be a regular person when I take this bag off. Also, I speak an awful lot about mental health on my podcast in particular. I'm someone who used to have quite bad mental health issues. And for the past 10 years, I kind of live a life with good mental health. I haven't had a relapse into anxiety or depression in, in over a decade. And I like talking about this a lot. I like communicating it to people who are listening to me. But the thing is, when you speak about mental health in the public eye, and if people listen to that and they take something from it, that can have a big impact on people. But what happens is, and I know this from, from friends of mine who are in the public eye who do speak about mental health, if you're then in a public place, if you're in a pub, if you're in the supermarket, if someone is struggling with anxiety, with depression, and they see you, they will come to you and they'll speak to you about what's going on in their lives. And the thing is, if that happens a lot, if that happens a lot to me, if, if every time I go to the pub, if every time I go to Aldi, a person is coming each time to tell me about their experience with depression, their experience with anxiety. Number one, it's, it's, it, that, that's emotionally would be quite draining for me. Number two, it's not necessarily a safe place or a safe space for me to speak to someone in that capacity if someone comes to me and says i've been having trouble with anxiety i need to be able to give that person proper space to actually listen to them but if it's in a, a, a pub i mightn't be able to do it you know so what the bag allows me to do is i can keep talking about mental health without that barrier because like i said friends of mine who are in the public eye sports people people who are tv presenters who speak about mental health they've actually had to back off it a little bit because of people approaching them in, in real life and what that can mean, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, the anonymity it provides you, it makes a lot of sense. Um, mm -hmm. I think 
the environment will be happy that you've moved the satin bags on your head too. <laughs> yeah, but here's the thing though, Leah. My my, because I, I people are always because I, I I also speak about climate change and you know climate action and th- getting people to to think about that and t- to be speaking about it. And I I always get these people, usually people's dads, <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, you're talking about the climate, but you're wearing a single use plastic bag, you hypocrite." <laughs> but the thing is, plastic bags you, they're single use. There's nothing you can do with a plastic bag. It's never going to decompose. So I'm actually environmentally friendly because I take something that will never decompose and I repurpose it and turn it into a mask. So my plastic bag is actually quite environmentally friendly. Mm. And I took ten thousand of them off. JCs and swords, and they replaced them with with a uh, re- uh, what do you call them? Not single use bags, the reusable Useful. ones. Well, so I'm very environmentally friendly. Yeah, perspective, deadly. <laughs> <laughs> Let you away with that one. Satin's good for your skin as well. So keep oh that. yeah, yeah, it feels lovely. Yeah, yeah, I love your mug by the way, the boss. I know. Yeah, I have to <laughs> apologize about this mug, right? Because people, because it makes me look like a dickhead. You know, it's just the mug is a pint. And I like having a pint of tea. I don't understand having a smaller volume of tea. But the only mug that I could get that was a pint said the boss on it. So if, if I'm the boss of nothing, man. I'm the, you know, just my mug thinks I am, but I'm not. You're the boss of your own life. You're I'm the boss of myself. I'm the architect of my own destiny. <laughs> That's a good mug now. There you go. <laughs> cool. So my next question, I suppose, is you have such a large platform, obviously. Yeah. And um, you have a very varied kind of skill set. And um, why mental health? What drew you to that kind of area? Well, so the thing with me and mental health is I I speak about mental health quite a bit on my podcast in particular. And what I always try and tell people is I'm not an expert, right? Mm-hmm. I when I I speak about mental health, but I try and do it ethically because we have an issue at the moment in society in general with people giving unsolicited advice, people putting themselves forwards as experts and they're not. And there's a lot of uh, muddying of who should be listened to and who shouldn't. So what I do when I speak about mental health, I have the, I have the authority and experience to speak about my own relationship with my mental health. And that's what I always do. I speak about my experience with anxiety, my experience with depression, what I did to help me. And when I keep it that way and, and it's, it's focused on me, then it's ethical. And if anyone's listening to it and they can take something from it, then fantastic. But I never mental health is really, really complex. You know, I have a a small amount of formal training in mental health. I studied for about three years to be a psychotherapist, but I stopped because then horse outside happened, you know, and it was like be a psychotherapist or tour the world having a mad laugh. So I chose tour the world and have a mad laugh. Yeah. (laughs) So I have like a basic grounding in, in psychotherapeutic concepts but I'm not fully qualified. So I never tell people, this is what you should do. That's what you should do. And as well, mental health is very complex. Everybody is different. Everyone is different. And the approach that one person needs to kind of arrive at a good place in their mental health journey is going to be different to another person's approach, you know? So I just speak about me. Yeah, fair enough. And I think it's important that you do now more than ever, you know, mental health is so intersectional and people are really going through it at the moment. So, Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I want to talk to you a little bit about stigma. That brings me on to my next question. So I think it's fair to say that we're hearing a lot more about mental health these days and it's great, but why do you think that is? Do you think there's more mental health issues now more than ever, or do you think it's becoming less stigmatized and people are more open to that conversation? Um, it's it's you know it's a bit of both, Leah, right? So I remember, I first started speaking about mental health as blind boy. I'd say around 2013, 2014, right? Mm-hmm. It was the recession was pretty bad. I I lost quite a few people to suicide. Um, it, I was a lot of my friends were quite feeling down. I was noticing it as a, as a trend in Ireland, and. I felt a duty. I was like, I was waking up every morning and I was looking at my Facebook page and I had like about 200,000 followers at that point back in 2013. And I was like, I used to have these issues and then I went to counselling in college and I worked through them and I have certain tools like cognitive behavioural therapy and stuff. Certain things that if I'd have heard these things back then, they would have been a great help to me. So I started using Facebook in particular just to speak a little bit about depression, anxiety, and hope that if someone saw it, it might help them in some way. And back then, 
it, mental health wasn't like when I was in college, like I'm in my thirties now. So I, I was in college in, in the two thousands. Like people didn't talk about anxiety, depression. When, when I brought it up with my friends back then, people would just go really, really quiet. The word panic attack wasn't used. Um, there wasn't like a huge big queue for mental health services either. You know what I mean? It was quite easy for me to, like the greatest thing college ever gave me, I, I went to art college. The greatest thing college gave me was access to weekly counseling because I wouldn't have been able to afford it otherwise, you know? Right. And so nowadays it, it's, it's, a, it's a combination of the two things. We're speaking about mental health more. We're speaking about anxiety, depression, all the different things that can go with, with, with poor mental health. So that means it's in people's minds more and people feel more comfortable saying it. And we have a much better language around it. When I was growing up, people used to use phrases like a nervous breakdown or they would say that someone's nerves are at them. You know what I mean? And these are antiquated phrases that we don't use anymore. The language is more developed. We can say anxiety at the dinner table now and people know what we're speaking about. But as well, I didn't have... The, the pressure with social media is a lot different right now, okay? It, it's, and what, what, what I always take it back to, from my personal opinion on it, there's a psychologist called Carl Rogers, okay? And Carl Rogers is one of the, 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 the kind of the, the, the he, he'd be seen as like the godfather of psychotherapy from like the 1950s. But Rogers has a theory on human personality that we have our real self and we have our ideal self. Now, our real self is the person that we actually are, okay? The person who we are in private, the person who your, your closest family members are allowed to see. Our real self is allowed to be insecure. Our real self isn't concerned with impressing people. But then we have our ideal self. Now, our ideal self is how we would like other people to perceive us, okay? Now, the thing is, if you live your life uh, depending only on external approval from other people, it can be very difficult to be happy because other people's approval is continually changing. So that's the ideal self. The thing with social media is social media rewards us for living in our ideal self. When you post on Instagram, we'll say, you have to look the best version of yourself. You have to have perfect opinion it's you're continually at all times editing a version of yourself that isn't real for the approval of people on the outside but the thing is when you get those likes it feels like real approval right so social media to use rogers's theory itself has created quite a it's created an environment for which is a lot more stressful than when i was growing up i didn't have social media when I was a teenager I, I was in like third year of college before Bebo or no I was in about first year before Bebo really started becoming a thing Bebo's not even around anymore no. but like it's 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 a it's a column a and column a column b thing social media definitely has created a, a an environment of heightened stress also you can't escape anymore like your your phone is in your hand so it's not just a matter of you go out to the nightclub at night time and you have interactions with people in real life and you, you're going, oh, I wonder what they thought about me. I wonder, did I look the right way? And then you go home and you get to go home and be at peace. That doesn't happen now. It's you're continually on your phone searching for this external approval, which is something you can't ever achieve. And one of the keys is to kind of defeat that is you try and figure out your, your real self, um, you try to develop what's known as an internal locus of evaluation, right? So an internal locus of evaluation is when your sense of worth comes from the inside. An external locus of evaluation is when your sense of worth and self-esteem comes from other people's approval, you know, or not even other people's approval, worrying too much about other people feeling envious of somebody else because they have something you don't have or feeling contempt about someone because you believe yourself to be above them. You know what I mean? These are all external things. And what they do is they don't contribute to a, a healthy sense of self-esteem. 
So what I do for me to try and maintain an internal locus of evaluation is I say to myself every day, I'm no better than anybody else and nobody else is better than me because I'm a complex human being and human beings are, they're, human beings are too complex to evaluate against each other. You can't. There's no such thing. How can one person be better than the other? So I try and focus on that so that I then have a, he a healthy sense of self-worth. And a healthy sense of self-worth for me is if I can go to bed at nighttime and I look in the mirror and I'm like, yeah, I feel good about myself. Like the most I can ask of myself is that I'm nice to other people. If I do that, if, if, I'm not, if, if in my daily interactions with people, I show people respect and I listen to them, and if that's all I do, if someone doesn't like me after that, or if someone thinks that I dress like an idiot, or if someone thinks I'm not good looking enough, all these things, they don't matter because all I can control is, am I giving basic respect to other people? Am I listening to other people? And when I focus on that, I've got a solid sense of self-esteem, you know? Absolutely. And come here, the alarm bells are going off, the social worker in me. Um, the Jahari's window is something similar when you talk about Rogers. Um, oh, what's that called? The Jahari's window. Right? I've never heard of that. Tell me. Well, it's similar. It's like um, there's three different kind of lenses and we see life through. So it's how we see ourselves, how others see us, and then how we think others see us. And how we think others see us is where we get so caught up. Um, as you say, and it's the only one of the three that isn't real, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, so in many ways we're wasting our time. And um, so to have that perspective, I think will be really valuable for so many students listening. So and Leah, Leah, in a social work context, why, uh, wh where does that, where, where would you use that? In what situation would you use the, the Jahari's window, you called it? Yeah, well, in the likes of, say, a probation setting, motivational interviewing, where people's self-esteem is on the floor, do you know? And mm -hmm. so concerned about what everyone's thinking about them and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. They don't change their actions because um, why would they? People don't think higher of them or better of them. Um, and so it's kind of a downward spiral. And um, so in order um, to kind of have them have that perspective, we often use techniques like that and the Rogers technique. So thanks for sharing that one. I'll be using that in future. Not a bother. And <laughs> the, just to take it back as well to one of your first questions there, when you were asking me, you know, how... When I was saying I, I'll try my hand at pretty much anything, yeah. it come that that's the reason I, I feel safe to try my hand at anything and fail. It's because I work on my self-esteem so much. So the thing is with like failure is a huge thing as an artist in particular. Failure is a, a, a huge part of my process, right? Because if you're scared of failing, then you won't try. And if you're an artist and you don't try, that means you can't work. Do you know what I mean? You get creative block. So I at all times have to be having a healthy sense of self-esteem and feeling safe to fail. And the way I do that is, and this doesn't just apply to artists. This can be students right now who, who are doing ex exams and stuff. Or if I can't allow my creative output right, my, which is an aspect of my behavior. I can't allow, we'll say my music, my books, my TV, I can't allow that to become an, a, um, an aspect of my ideal self. Right. So I, if, I, if, I, if I go to bed at nighttime and I look into the mirror and I say to myself, today you had a really good Twitter post, today you made a really good video and loads of people liked it, you're a good person. If I did that, I'd end up with pretty shit self-esteem very quickly because right. what I'm doing there, I'm placing my self-worth in aspects of my behavior. Now, this can be the same for if there's a student in the college now and this person is studying literature. And if you're studying literature and part of your identity is for everyone around you to see you as you're so smart, you know everything about James Joyce, you know everything about Sally Rooney. If your identity as a literary, a literary student, is to be seen as this really intelligent person who's on the ball, you're going to end up in, a, in, a, in, in trouble with mental health because what you've done now is you've placed your self-worth, your sense of self-esteem in an external aspect of your behavior. And when you do that, then the prospect of failing doesn't become about just fucking up an exam or it doesn't become about uh, speaking up in a lecture theater and 
being, you know, maybe maybe you speak up in a lecture theater and what you say isn't on point, and a few people go, that was a that was a stupid point. If your identity, if 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 your 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 to be seen as a good student or to be seen as someone who's smart is part of your identity, when you fail, you you feel that as failing as a human being, which is very deeply, deeply hurtful. And then failure becomes a terrifying thing. And all of a sudden now you've got block. You can't try. You're stressed. You're overwhelmed. The exam at the end of the year is no longer a simple exam where you can rationally say to yourself, here's an exam. Here's what I have to learn. Here's the amount of work I need to do to try and succeed. Instead, it becomes, if I fail this, I'm a piece of shit human being. If I fail this, I oh this fear that I have that I'm not as smart as I thought I was, this is going to confirm it. And now all of a sudden what happens? Your brain is overcome with emotion. You're not able to use your cognitive faculties properly. You're thinking in an emotional way. You're not planning. You're procrastinating. That's where procrastination comes from. Procrastination is the utter fear of failure. When you are so scared of failing that your brain will create these defense mechanisms to do anything other than the task that you're supposed to do. So, I focus on my self-esteem so that never happens with me because it can. Yeah. Like I, I, my job is social media. So when I release a piece of work, if I release a podcast and put it online, when loads of people like that and say to me, blind boy, that's excellent. My job is to see those compliments and, and not take them in. I can't allow it. Yeah. I have to just say to myself, today I created a podcast that I'm happy with. If people like it, great. If they don't like it, uh, not uh, if they don't like it so what I can try again but I can't allow my my sense of self-worth and I don't think any of us can your self-worth can't be dependent upon aspects of your behavior or your performance it has to come from inside yeah and I think that's an important message to hear now more than ever and um, as students spend more time online you know and um, all of our teaching has gone remotely um, mm -hmm. and most part and I suppose we're an academic institution first and um, I'd be very interested to hear about your experience of education and did your mental health ever interrupt that experience? Um, so I failed my leaving cert. I flat out, I failed my leaving cert, right? Okay. Um, I would say I, I was most definitely failed by the education system. Um, I would have been called an incredibly disruptive student. And looking back now as an adult in my 30s, I know that my disruptiveness, it wasn't disruptiveness at all. It was curiosity, creativity. It was uh, the stimulation that I required, the, which was unique to my personality, that was not being provided by the academic services in, in secondary school. And teachers didn't spot it. And they just said, he's a bad kid. You know, um, what I, I, I wanted to be a performer. That's what, I, that's what I do now. I'm an adult performer. I like to create things. I liked to entertain people in class. I like to say funny things that made people laugh. I liked to, instead of studying economics, I liked to be at the back of the classroom drawing, but that didn't fit into the system. So I was pushed to the side. And at a young age, I was pretty much told you're bad. You, you deserve to be in detention. And when the system and the environment and the adults tell you you're bad, you're bad, you're bad. At about 13, I basically said, yeah, fuck it, I'm bad, so I'm going to show you how bad I can be. And then I really did become quite a disruptive person who needed to be, I was kicked out in sixth year and I, I, I failed uh, foundation maths. I didn't get a leaving cert, you know. Yeah. Um, I was lucky to have gotten a second chance. I got into art college because oh. I didn't have the points in the leaving cert, but I got 600 points in my art college portfolio. And they said, well, look, you can clearly do art. We don't care if you can do maths or not. And that gave me self-esteem. And when I got into art college, it was the first time ever that a teacher told me that I am good, you know? And I was 18 at that point. I'm a fucking adult, like. And what that did for my self-worth and my self-esteem, it gave me that little bit of belief in myself. But at the same time, I, I was terrified of, of the idea of being an adult when I was 18. And, and this... In my opinion, I think this is why so many mental health issues kind of present at about 18 or 19. We're raised our entire lives, like, you know, with school and parents, with everything kind of provided for us 
in, in a sense, you know, and then all of a sudden at 18, it's cut off and it's like, there you go. Now you're, you're an adult. Go out there. And if you fuck up, you mightn't have a roof over your head. Yeah. And when that happened to me, it terrified me. Now, the thing with me as well, I, I had I had asthma as a kid. And my dad would have been quite an anxious person. So when I was diagnosed with asthma at about three or four, the doctors would have said to my dad, like, oh, he's got asthma now. you got to mind him. And my dad, being an anxious person, would have said, what do you mean? They said, well, you know, he could get an asthma attack. And then my dad would have said, and what, what, what happens if he gets an asthma attack? And doctors are never going to sugarcoat something. They're going to say, he'd be under distress. But like, you know, he could die if he got an asthma attack. I'm not saying it will happen, but he could. So my dad then heard, oh, he's got asthma. If he gets an asthma attack, he's going to die. And then he would have asked the doctors, what will give him an asthma attack or oh, running too fast, uh, overexerting himself. So at a young age, my parents kind of, they didn't let me go out and play soccer with the other kids right. in case I ran too much and got an asthma attack. And it was for my safety. But what that ended up doing to me was eventually I stopped being allowed to do things that were normal. Do you get me? So what's normal? What the rest of my peers are doing is they're running around in the field playing soccer at five years of age. Then you get to 10 or 12 and people are having sleepovers. And sleepovers are a really important thing for, for development because it's like you're leaving your house at 12, 13 to stay in someone else's house and your, your parents aren't there. And it's, it's a huge thing for finding who you are and becoming yourself. Awesome. And I wouldn't have been allowed because it's like, well, what if you get an asthma attack over in your friend's house and you don't have your nebulizer to, to alleviate the asthma attack? And what happened then when I got to about 18 or 19, I had internalized that to behave normally as my peers are doing means death. Now, I wasn't aware of this. This was deeply unconscious. So then I get to 18, 19 and I'm in college and all my friends are going out to nightclubs and going to pubs. And I couldn't. I would go to a nightclub and all of a sudden I get a very, very intense panic attack. I don't know where it came from. I'm just fucking terrified. And I felt like I am dying. When I was getting panic attacks in the moment, it's like I am dying. That's what I felt like. Mm -hmm. So I ended up protecting myself by not going to nightclubs, not going to pubs, staying in my room as much as possible. Then what happens? I start going into lectures in college and I'm getting panic attacks in lectures now. And I'm trying to sit down and I can't focus on what the lecturer is saying because I'm worried about I am currently dying. And then I started engaging in all these safety behaviors. I can go to the lecture hall if my seat is the closest seat to the door, you know, and I was creating all these boundaries until eventually then I couldn't go to lectures. Yeah. And when I couldn't go to lectures, I was like, fuck, you're here in college now. You're in art college. You're doing what you absolutely love for the first time in your life. You're you're, you're, you're the good student in the class who's making good work. And I just felt there's no way I'm going to fuck this up for myself because of the whatever that whatever's happening to me. And it would have been someone who's in your role right now. I remember we had orient orienteering in first year and they gave us the talk and they said counseling services. And most people didn't listen to it because mental health wasn't part of that conversation back then. So I just said, fuck it. This isn't right. Whatever, whatever's happening to me where I feel like I'm going to die. I thought I, I thought I was developing schizophrenia. That's, that's how little mental health was spoken about back then. And this is only 10 years ago. I thought I was getting schizophrenia. And I went to a counselor for free in college. And they just said to me, what you've experienced is called a panic attack. And all it is, it's a fire alarm going off in your body and there's no fire. And that's all it is. And as soon as I heard that, as soon as I had a label for what was happening to me, then 50% of it alleviated. I, I could identify with it now. I could open up a book and I could read what a panic attack was like for other people. And what that does then is you don't feel as lonely and isolated anymore because you're like, oh, loads of people get this. But another thing I battled with around panic attacks is, so anxiety and depression for me worked together. Right. So when I would like, my friends would ring me up and go, we're all going out to the nightclub tonight. Will you come? I'm going, no, I'm not doing it. And I was making up lies. I'm not saying to them, I can't go to the nightclub because this thing happens where I think I'm going to die. There's no way I'm saying that. 
So I just come up with excuses. Oh, I don't like that place. It's full of wankers. No, I'm not going there. This person's there and they don't like me. You know what I mean? Creating all this drama for myself. And when I do that, I get the sense of alleviation of, okay, I'm safe in my bubble, in my room. I don't have to go outside. But then I'd get a deep sense of shame because I would feel shame about the fact that I, I can't do this normal thing that other people can do. And then the sense of shame caused me to, to self-talk. In a, I, I'd say to myself, yeah, of course you can't go to the nightclub. You're fucking weak. You're weak. You're pathetic. You're a piece of shit. And all this internal self-talk then led to depression. So anxiety and depression work together for me because the behavior of anxiety, not being able to go to pubs or shopping centers mm -hmm. caused me to experience shame, which then experience, turned me to, to a person who was experiencing depression. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, that's really interesting you mentioned that. I think a lot of people will identify with that kind of um, situation and experience. I think um, our cohort of students primarily is 18 to 22, really formative yeah. years, as you mentioned. Um, and I think the awareness um, that there are supports there for them is so important. Um, our student counselling services here, um, I'm here for them, their welfare officer, and it's important they recognise that. And listen, that, that's, that's something... Here. Sorry, Leah, go on. No, go on. Uh, that's something, whenever I speak in a mental health capacity in colleges in particular, I always try and raise with uh, someone like yourself what our services like. Because here's the thing. If I come on, if I come into a college or I do a Zoom chat like this and I'm speaking about how I helped myself using things like cognitive behavioral therapy, that was, that was the huge thing for me. I learned about cognitive behavioral therapy and that, taught me how to manage my anxiety that's at work for me mm. I if I'm speaking to whoever's watching right now I want to be able to say to them you can follow the steps that I did you can access free counseling in college to make the first step but I need to know what our service is like in Trinity I don't want to say this to a student body and then they're going I'd love to do that blind boy, but the waiting list is six months long. I can't do it. So what are services like right now in Trinity and, and what needs to change in your opinion? Great question. And I think number one, what needs to change is the resources. And um, so at the moment, our counseling service has been overwhelmed by obviously the difficult time um, and the waiting list at the moment straight up is about two weeks long and there are emergency consultations. So if you're stuck and want to speak to someone right now, um, you will be seen too. If you contact me, welfare at TCDSU, I'll make sure that happens. Um, we also have other services like Nightline. They run a fantastic um, direct messaging service on so nightline.ie. You can speak to them um, in the evening times. And then we endorse a crisis text line to kind of um, combat the waiting list. So um, if you text TCD to 50808, you can speak to someone right now, anytime you like, um, and get that help that you need. Um, but as you say, um, it's all well and good sending people to these services, but will they be, be seen too? Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to assure students that they will be in some capacity, um, but I do believe we need more resources and funding to hire new counsellors um, to run different support groups, to carry out studies that will inform the work that we're providing. Um, and it does, it comes down to money. And I know us as a student's union, we're working hard um, to lobby the government for that money. And the Minister for Higher Education has committed to a short term um, amount of money um, to alleviate mental health issues specifically. So I suppose there's a bit of good news for you. Um, another bit of good news, I'm delighted after hearing your asthmatic um, history that you've moved to a satin <laughs> um, plastic bag and not a plastic one. Yeah. <laughs> but that's a side note. Um, so I suppose I have another question for you and you have a yeah. great podcast. We'll so give it a little plug. I don't think it needs a plug. I'm sure loads of people listen to it. I personally am a big fan. Um, Thank you. But in your podcast, you speak about your mental health philosophy and kind of how you understand mental health through the past, pe present and future. And so people can go and listen to that if they like. But an area I was particularly interested in was the present. And you speak about CBT. How do you suppose... Um, students who are experiencing something like anxiety at the moment take active steps themselves to combat it? Good question for you. Um, so, I mean, so when I speak about the present moment, what I'm speaking about is, is uh, mindfulness, okay? So I, I, I engage in mindfulness as, as much as I can 
throughout my day. Now, mindfulness simply means so. So, OK. When you're experiencing poor mental health, you're not mindful, right? Mm -hmm. An entire day can go because you are simple things like having imaginary arguments in your head with people, thinking about a conversation that happened a month ago and you're furiously angry about how it did or didn't go and replaying over in your head what you should have said to the person. Or maybe you're mortified about something you said to someone two years ago and you're replaying over and over again what, sh what should have hap has been said in that situation. That right there is not mindful activity. And when you're having difficulties with mental health, you tend not to be mindful. You're living in, you're worrying about something that hasn't happened yet or worrying about something that's already happened. And yet neither of those things you have much control over, yet you dedicate your entire day to really stressing about it. So if you think about it, the stress, because being anxious all day long is, is physically stressful. Like you're, I don't know the correct terminology now, I've forgotten it since I studied it, but basically when you experience anxiety or when you experience intense anger or intense depression, the emotional part of your brain takes over. And the emotional part of your brain can override the kind of the cog, the, the part of your brain that uses rational, logical thinking. So that's why when you have anxiety, like I, I used to be fully convinced that a nightclub was going to kill me. Or I used to be fully, con I used to be af literally afraid of my shadow. I used to see my shadow on the wall and get really anxious going, how do I know? How do I know the difference between me and my shadow? That's called depersonalization. I was depersonalizing my sense of worth and self-esteem and, and my grounding in who I am was so poor that I was doubting whether my shadow belonged to me or not. That's how bad I was. And that sounds crazy. It is. I was, I was crazy at that point because my rational brain isn't working because it's all this, em, the emotional brain at all time. And then that sends adrenaline all over your body. What it also does too. Actually, I'll tell you the evolutionary reasons for it, right? Yeah. We, we call that part of the brain the lizard brain. And the reason we call it that is millions, billions of years. No, millions and millions of years ago, before the dinosaurs, the first creatures that crawled out of the oceans, these little lizards, right? Yeah. They, I think it's called the amygdala. I think it's called the amygdala, but I, I could be wrong. These little lizards had the amygdala, and it's a very simple part of the brain. And it's responsible for our fight or flight response. Fight, flight, or freeze. So these lizards, they weren't thinking. All they were doing was, how can I get food? How can I avoid being someone else's food? How can I have sex? Those were the kind of three things their brain was worried about. And yeah. And if one of these little lizards was, a bigger lizard comes along and wants to eat them, they would literally, their amygdala would trigger They'd get a rush of adrenaline. They'd run. And what they'd also do is they'd shit themselves, right? Because a little lizard shitting themselves, because they're so small, it meant losing body weight and being able to run away quicker. Wow. But today, still, if you experience anxiety, a lot of it happens down here in the stomach. Like we have the phrase, oh, they were bricking it. They were shitting it. Yeah. That exists because of a lizard millions and millions of years ago. We still have the amygdala up here. Yeah. But now you're sitting in a library, you're not getting a panic attack because there's an actual physical existential threat. Mm -hmm. There's no bear going to eat you. Instead, what the threat is, it's a threat to your sense of self, your sense of, sense of identity. You get this rush of adrenaline in your body. And now all of a sudden, your stomach's in knots, you know, and yeah. someone who experiences anxiety for a lot of time, they'll tell you they can't eat food. Because your body doesn't want to digest when you're in that situation. Your body wants to get the fuck away. Digestion is what happens when you're relaxed. And you end up fucking your stomach up. You know what I mean? So there's all these physical things that happen when you're living with long-term anxiety. What? But what would I say to someone? So I use cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, what I'd suggest is if you're enjoying what I'm chatting about here today, go up and look, look up my podcast. I have three of them that are basically an intro to cognitive behavioral therapy um, or look it up online. A great book is cognitive behavioral therapy for dummies. I know that sounds silly, but I've seen all the cognitive behavioral therapy great. books yeah. for dummies book is fantastic. It's a really, really good book. So how do I use CBT or how did I use it to, to, to manage my anxiety? 
when you are in a state of mental unhealth and you're living in the future or you're living in the past and you have all these thoughts, that's quite overwhelming because you feel like you're carrying too many thoughts around and you can't focus and you can't escape them. So what CBT basically posits is that we feel the way we think. So when I had anxiety, the way that I was thinking about myself, we said the voice inside myself, the voice that, that I communicate with when I'm on my own, the voice that I, we're, we're, like we're in a continual state of dialogue with ourselves when we're on our own. We're always talking to ourselves, asking ourselves questions. And when you have anxiety, your inner voice is like a bully. Your inner voice is, it's like this person who knows everything about you and they know every fear that you have about yourself and they continually tell it to yourself. They continue. So my, I would have been saying to myself all day, you're weak, you're pathetic. I'd look at someone else and I'd say, they're so cool. They're so much better than me. I could never have what they have. And then the flip side is I would see someone who I perceive to be lower than me and I'm going, look at the state of them. I'm better than them. And I have this continual toxic internal dialogue, which is nonstop telling me how shit I am, how pathetic I am, how I'll never succeed, how I'll never fail, how I have very little worth. And this then continual talk, that's my thinking process. This was then triggering um, emotions of anxiety. If you tell yourself that the world is terrifying, that you can't contr control anything, that everything is a threat. If you think that way all day long, you begin to feel that way. And that would, I would then feel that as intense anxiety that would then manifest in my behavior as anxiety attacks, then avoiding places where I perceive uh, anxiety to be occurring. So I've now associated, I think I'm worthless. And I'm thinking this while I'm, I, I'm in, in, in fucking duns looking at an aubergine. Yeah. Uh, but while I'm looking at the aubergine, because I'm not, what I should be doing is living in the present moment and admiring the lovely aubergine and going, wow, which one of these aubergines is going to be the tastiest for dinner? I'm not. I'm staring at the aubergines. But inside here, I'm not paying attention to the aubergines. I'm saying to myself, you're a fucking worthless piece of shit, man. Man, you're so weak. Oh, look at their cool pants. You could never pull off those pants, man. You're a piece of shit. And that's why I'm thinking, ignoring the aubergines, then I get a panic attack. And I'm not associating the, the thoughts with that. And now I'm anxious in front of the aubergines. Now I need to run out of the supermarket and I'm terrified now of both supermarkets and aubergines. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not, I'm not investigating the irrationality of that. And I'm not fully aware of it. I could get triggered by an aubergine in the kitchen. If my ma brought one home, do you know what I'm saying? That's how this works. Yeah. You go, all right, call you may. I am a worthless piece of shit. Then you go, where's the evidence? You know, you're right. Where is the evidence that I'm a worthless piece of shit? And the thing is, there is no evidence. There, there's no evidence. It's, 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 it's your anxiety bully. Your internal voice is telling you this and you believe it, but you have it on a piece of paper and you treat, you treat it like a scientist and you go, no, I, I love my ma. I love my dad. I was nice to someone last week. I'm not a piece of shit. And then you start to realize, oh, I'm dealing with an internal bully right here, you know? And then you go at the emotions and you go, I experienced anxiety. Why did I need to experience anxiety? Or what's a better version than, of anxiety? Fear. Like fear is an appropriate response to an actual trigger. But anxiety rarely isn't. Anxiety is much more of a lack of control thing. Fear is an appropriate response, but anxiety isn't. And fear is rational and manageable. Then you go to see in behaviors. I ran out of the supermarket. I vouched that I would never return to another supermarket. Where's the evidence that that's rational? And that's what CBT is. It, you start off on paper, but then eventually what happens, and this is where I'm at right now, when you do that more and more in a little workbook, it starts to become the way that you think. It's like, I always, the, the metaphor that I use is, is if, if, you, if, if every evening you go to the shop to get a can of Coke at seven o'clock every evening, and between your house and the shop is a field, okay? Yeah. When you go to the shop, there's going to be a, a natural furrow in the field where people just walk through, you know, because it's a field. Mm -hmm. So you take that path every single day, right? And you, without thinking it, it's like that's the path to the field. Your brain is a bit like that. When you have anxiety, the, the, the pathway of your thinking 
it's always the negative. Whatever happens to you in your environment, you will, your brain will confirm everything to you to confirm your negative beliefs about yourself. So if, if I get onto a bus and the bus conductor doesn't acknowledge me, when I'm in a state of anxiety, I go, bus, talk, bus conductor didn't acknowledge me because they can tell what a pathetic piece of shit I am. You know what I mean? But when I'm not in a state of mental unhealth, I walk onto the same bus and I go, the bus conductor didn't acknowledge me because they might be having a tough day. And now I've used empathy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the same thing has happened, but how I've interpreted it is completely differently. So to take it back to the pathway in the grass, learning CBT is basically you're creating a new pathway, a better one. And it's difficult at first. Yeah. If you are to create that new pathway in the grass, like the first few trips are going to be difficult. You're going to be stomping over grass. You'll be getting more mud on your feet. You might get stung by nettles, but eventually that becomes the new easier path and the other one just grows over. And that's where I am right now. So I, I won't guess if I'm an anxious person mm. and I'm still going to be susceptible to these anxious thoughts that lead to anxiety. But when they come in, I naturally challenge them like a scientist. And I go, hold on a second. Where's the evidence for that? Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I love that. And it's so refreshing to hear you speak so openly about it and normalize it. Because I think, as you say, people spend so much time in their heads. And yeah. I love how you think critically about um, the thoughts that your inner bully, as you say, um, mm -hmm. Are kind of saying to you critical thinking is something that we push here as an academic institution you know it's a sign of academic excellence so why can't we apply that to our personal lives you know if something's hindering our work and um, yeah. anxiety it's something that and um, it's the number one reason people subscribe to our disability service here in college so i'm really glad that we're you know having an open conversation yeah and, and just just to say as well leah that like see i'm i'm talking about cbt because that's what worked for me right. like there's like there's many different approaches that people use and CBT happens to be the one that worked for me because as well, I, I have that type of critical brain. That's the, it suited me, but there's many other different things that suit other people. What, another thing I use is, is meditation and mindfulness. So mindfulness is, it's the opposite of that situation I described there where you're living in the future or you're living in the past negatively. Mindfulness is being in the shop and actually appreciating the aubergines that are there. Right. Literally mindfulness for me is if I'm washing the dishes, if I'm feeding my cats, I catch myself if I'm not in the present moment. So I just literally when I'm washing the dishes, if I'm thinking about something that's happening next week, I say, no, fuck that. Let's enjoy the dishes right here. And I start thinking of my senses. I ground myself. I st all I do is I think, wow, I'm noticing how this washing up liquid feels in my hands. I'm hearing the bubbles popping. I'm using all my senses. And that's a very peaceful space because when you're mindful like that and time feels differently, you have, it's, it's why when you go on fucking holiday, your first day on holiday, the entire day feels like a week. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas you're sitting at home now, especially with, with coronavirus, a day can go like that, but you're on holiday and a day feels like a week because when you're on holiday, Everything has to be mindful because everything is new. The fucking, the road signs are different. The air is different. The temperature is different. You're continually using your senses at all times to check this new environment. So you live mindfully. So I try and do that as part of my day. Whatever I'm doing, if it's even drinking my tea, I mindfully engage in every single process I'm doing because you breathe and you relax when that's happening and you're leaving good amounts of oxygen into your lungs. And I'm not grilling myself over things I don't have any control over, you know? CBT in a nutshell is... Look, it, actually, my, my general philosophy, and it, it kind of comes from CBT and a bit of existentialism as well, is I have no control over what happens to me in my life. I have no control, but I have full control over how I react to it. So whatever the fuck happens to me, whatever life throws at me, even coronavirus, yeah. I have no control over it. And I'm okay with that because as an anxious person, I want to control it all. Part of my anxi anxiety is I can't deal with all the shit that's outside of my control. So I say, no, 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 
this is outside of my control. But no matter what happens, I have full control over how I think about it, how I react to it, how I view it. And that keeps me mindful and calm. Yeah, and that's so important, I think, now more than ever, because people are feeling like things are so out of their control. And in many ways they are. But as you say, it's so important to externalize that problem and really focus on what we can control. And that's, yeah, how we think adopting these little practices like the mindful wash. My nanny's the biggest advocate for that. She's like, Leah, wash the dishes and pay attention to that water on your hands and dry them um, mindfully. So yeah, she'll be delighted that you made reference to that's, that. But, but that's meditation. That's like uh, even fucking nuns counting rosary beads. You know what I mean? It, yeah. It's all mindful. Prayer is a mindful thing. This isn't a new thing. It's it's just it's it's a focused way. And meditation is the best example. Now, meditation is another one. I meditate. I love it. It works for me. Meditation. I don't recommend meditation for everybody because especially some people, some people's mental health issues could be rooted in in body trauma. They might have gotten into a fight or a car crash and they might have emotions stored in parts of their bodies that they're not aware of. So meditation can actually be be dodgy for some people because they can awaken trauma they're unaware of and unaware of in parts of their body. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I don't recommend meditation for everybody, but mindfulness, I'd recommend mindfulness. Yeah. Just make sure what whatever you pick one task today, usually something that you consider boring and literally just do it and try and use every single one of your senses to do it. Yeah, and for sure, listening that want to get involved in things like mindfulness and meditation, because it can seem so far away sometimes. Um, we have a fantastic meditation society on campus you can get involved that way mindfulness we do mindfulness and um, guided mindfulness sessions and um, if you want to you know help yourself ease into that and um, go to the counseling website and there's some resources there for you but yeah you're, you're so right we need to focus on what is real and keep it in the present and especially at times of these so thanks for sharing that and we're coming towards the end um, and can, can i make one little point of course you can um, just it's because it's something I meant to cover earlier, but I didn't. So one one kind of critique that gets thrown against me when I speak about mental health is people say, "How the fuck can he talk about something as serious as depression, anxiety, suicide, and do it while looking like a clown with a bag on his head?" You know, right. and it's it, that's something I meant to say this around the conversation about st- stigmatizing, right? Mm-hmm. Humor mm-hmm. is part of being a human right? Humor is an essential aspect of the human condition. And a part of the stigma around mental health, we have this belief that we must be serious and solemn about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. That when someone talks about depression or anxiety, what we actually do, and it's, I, I think it's unhealthy. We take on this persona of solemnity. It's a bit like, I'll tell you a classic example. If you ever have to go to, if, if your friend's dad or mother dies and you go to their, 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 their ma's funeral and this is someone you know, it's your fucking friend, someone who you have crack with and we've all done it. And you get to the point where at the funeral, they're at the front row with their family and you have to go and shake their hand. And when you see your friend who's just lost a sibling or someone close to him and you have to shake their hand and you have to say sorry for troubles. And in that moment, they stop being your friend. What you want to do is you want to give them a hug. You want to you want to you want to have something that's a bit more authentic to your relationship. But the formality of funerals asks us to take on this persona of solemnity. But like it happened with me, my friend's dad died when I was younger and I'm up there with like he was one of my best friends. Sorry for troubles. Like, what the fuck? That's not authentic to our relationship. Mm -hmm. And it didn't feel right. What that is, is solemnity. Solemnity is it's like you're LARPing seriousness. It's a performed seriousness. And when someone brings up depression, anxiety, suicide, it's scary. It's frightening. When we hear it, it frightens us. So what we do is we, without knowing it, we take on the persona of solemn. I'm going to listen to this person. Now I'm going to be very serious and very respectful. And the thing is, empathy doesn't get to exist within solemnity. And you can be serious about something. Like I'm very serious about mental health. I care deeply about it. I'm alive because I had access to services and techniques that allowed me to overcome it because I wouldn't be alive. I'll be honest. I wouldn't be here right now if I didn't have that. And I'm really serious about it, but I'm okay 
incorporating humor into how I talk about it. I can look like a clown. I can make jokes about fucking aubergines while still talking about something as serious as mental health because I don't want to let solemnity into the conversation. Solemnity actually is what increases stigma because when someone's being solemn, it's not authentic and it puts everyone else on edge. And the thing is with solemnity, solemnity is, is often used by institutions to communicate power. If you think of like the most solemn things in the world, uh, churches, the way that uh, priests and bishops carry on, mm -hmm. absolutely solemn. You don't fucking laugh in church. The military, there's complete solemnity in the military. Obey the fucking rules. No laughter. And the legal system, that's also incredibly solemn with no room for humor. And solemnity is a performed seriousness that communicates power. And fuck that. Do you know what I mean? Cool. Yeah, you can be serious without being solemn. And I think mm -hmm. some people taught me that fairly quickly. Uh, if you don't laugh, you'll cry in many respects. So, <laughs> yeah. Thanks for sharing that, too. And before you go now, I want to ask you a question and I want to encourage other people to ask the same question to anyone who's important in their life or even a stranger to just check in with them. How are you? How's Blind Boy today? I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. You know, I'm. I'm I'm you I'm 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 generally a between a uh, seven and a ten in terms of my happiness, okay. um because I you know b b mental health is part of my day and um finding meaning is part of my day, right. but I'm also very fucking privileged in that. I'm for, I I'm doing what I love as a job, um, getting to create getting to make art, is fundamental to who I am as a human being happiness comes from being able to find it something that gives you a sense of meaning and the thing that gives me meaning is also what pays my bills so i literally as a job get to do what i love every single day so that contributes massively to the happiness that i experience also i'm very fortunate that i i, I grew up with love i i even though I had these problems with, with anxiety, I, I, at a young age, I never, ever doubted whether my parents or anyone around me loved me. I never had to doubt that. And it's something I always check in terms of my privilege because I don't know. It's just that stands to me. Some people, they might have grown up in houses where the parents were fighting. They had to wonder whether the, does my dad love me? Does my ma love me? And that can create issues as an adult. So that's really stood to me. So I'm feeling good right now. I'm feeling good right now, but I'm, I'm able to work from home. You know what I mean? I don't have a job that puts me at risk out in the pandemic. I'm, I'm doing quite well right now, but it's not just because I'm like running all the time and meditating and all this. There's environmental factors too, you know? Yeah, I really admire that self-awareness because I think with that, you can make informed decisions. You know, once you know yourself and understand yourself, it better helps you to understand other people. Um, and I think I think that's the biggest form of like emotional intelligence and mm -hmm. the is more of it right now. So fair play. Now, before you go, <laughs> I have one more question for you. So you're a great writer. OK, and a lot of people will know this. And I think great writers appreciate great writers. And um, would you mind leaving us with a quote? I will. And I'm going to leave you with a quote from uh, an ex-Trinity student, Samuel Beckett, even though I've got the portrait of Flann O'Brien from UCD in uh, the background. Controversial. But, <laughs> um, Samuel Beckett's got a lovely quote and it's something I use every single day as an artist, which is try again, fail, get, try again, fail again, fail better. And that's it. And, and it doesn't have to be art, whatever the fuck you're doing. Try and incorporate failure as part of your process, because when you do that, you're not scared of failure and you, you will, you'll try. You, you, the worst that can happen is you make a buttocks of it. Who gives a shit? Absolutely. And I think on that note, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much. For Thanks, Leah.